I wanted to go ahead and start us off. Hello to everybody on Zoom. I'm seeing that there's some of you out there. And thank you to everyone who's here in person. This looks like a great group. So I'm very, very proud and pleased to announce that Beth Fetchke has joined us from New York University. I'm all the way from New York. Um, Beth is a really interesting person for this department. She has a long legacy of studying kind of organizational ethnography. So looking really in depth in everyday work practices and how people work and in the doing so, how they engage with objects, technologies, and the kind of nature of situated expertise, coordination, control, communication, which really filters into so much of what we study here in this department. Um, her new book is Blood, Powder, and Residue, How Crime Labs Translate Evidence into Proof. And I think she's gonna be telling us a little bit about that book, but also getting into some more of her kind of current and future research interests. Um, just to be clear, Beth is the Seymour Milstein Professor of Ethics and Corporate Governance and Strategy at the Stern School of Business, as well as a professor of sociology at New York University. And we are super, super happy to have you here. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Um, it's so exciting. This is like my first live talk um, since the pandemic. So it is really great to have people in the room. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I want to talk about just generally sociology of work and studying work and technology. Um, this has been quite an exciting time the last five years, I would say, for scholars of work and technology. Also a bit scary, but, um, but also there's been just a lot of interesting changes. And so my talk is going to be kind of a broad talk about like approaches to studying work and technology. I'm going to talk a, a bit about different things, a little bit about my past work. Then I'm going to talk about two of my current papers, one of which is coming from this book on crime labs. And then a little bit about my future research directions and where it's all going. Um, I want to start with- Is anybody here, by the way? I just want to make sure with this. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Sorry. excellent. Um, oh, and I did want to say like, I can't follow, please feel free to put things in chat. Um, Daniel is going to like kind of monitor it for me, but I can't see it at all up here. I don't know what's going on. Um, so, and please feel free to interrupt. I come from a business school environment where they probably wouldn't have even let me get this far beforehand go, <laughs> what goes up. So please feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, I just want to start with a story of a firm called Kensho. Kensho is a machine learning startup and it's in kind of the fintech space. Um, that is an image of its engineers at the top of the, of the screen. Um, in 2016, Kensho started to get a lot of attention. They were, they were starting to grow. They were funded by Goldman Sachs. And what they do is they create, it's basically an AI app that searches giant data sets and parses them in order for financial analysts to do like kind of comparative market analysis to decide what kind of investments banks should be making. Um, and at the time in 2016, they had started to get a lot of interest from other investment banks and their technology was being adopted in a lot of places. Um, and again, I live in New York, so finance is very big in New York. So it's, it's one of these things that you hear about a lot. Um, and this story, the robots are coming for Wall Street showed up in the New York Times Magazine. And Kensho is like kind of typical of an AI startup and especially at this time, which is everybody was talking about it as, you know, it's making these giant leaps and bounds in efficiency for banks in terms of what the financial analysts are doing. Um, and th there's a lot of media hype about, you know, what this company was gonna do to revolutionize um, finance. And um, so basically the story said, you know, these guys at the top of the screen are coming to replace the people at the bottom of the screen, the Wall Street analysts are gonna get put out of work. And I would say Kensho is unusual only in that its founder was really willing to go on record lots of places saying frequently and publicly that he thought that their technology was gonna put a lot of people out of work, <laughs> right? And this is very much the story in 2016, 2017, about AI, right? AI, robots, they're all coming for your job. And this software, you know, could perform analysis in like 10 minutes that it would take finance analysts like days or weeks to do on their own. Um, and he was saying things like, you know, within a decade, between a third and a half of the current employees in finance are gonna lose their jobs to Kensho and other automation software. And that was actually what the media was saying generally, right? So at that time, if you like went on the Economist website, like they had 
a thing right on their homepage that you could type in what your job was and they would tell you what percentage of it by 2030 was going to be taken over by computers and AI, right? This was sort of the rhetoric that was going on around AI. And I saw this and I thought, I want to share this story with my students. But I, I think the story about what's going on with AI and other technologies in the digital economy isn't quite as simple as just, it's going to put a whole lot of people out of jobs. It's not as straightforward as that. And as, a, as someone who studies work in technology, I see a whole series of questions about technology and work in organizations that really need more nuanced answers to, to, the, to the question of what's going to happen. And that's what I try to do in my own work. And so some of the questions that I see as being really important to understanding how technologies are changing the workplace are questions like, how do people develop skill and expertise at work? So if you think about Kensho and the way that they were doing things, um, how were financial analysts doing their work before? Um, what will it actually change about their work? Are there ways that we can make those changes without de-skilling the people whose jobs are you know, supposedly being replaced, right? Um, another question I think is really important is the question of collaboration. So how do people in organizations get work done together? <clears throat> if you think about in the Kensho situation, if you put this AI into a bank, what does that mean for the work of the rest of the bankers that are gonna have to adapt around that technology? How are they gonna work together? Um, what are they gonna do with it, right? And then the third kind of question I think is really important is a question about institutional and organizational mechanisms that influence how work unfolds. So if you ask this question about Ken Show, you might ask something like, who in these banks is making the decision to purchase Ken Show's technology? How are they deciding to roll it out in the organization? And what are they deciding to do with it? And then what happens as a consequence of that? And so my research is really all about these kinds of questions. So what, what are the social dynamics around work in organizations? And I, I spend a lot of time thinking about how is it that what people do at work evolves in concert with the technologies that they're using? And that these are the kinds of dilemmas that my research explores. And as Melissa said, I'm an organizational ethnographer. So what I do is I typically go into an organization and I spend maybe a year there and try to figure out how the people in that organization get their work done. And my goal is really to build some organizational theory around the data that I'm collecting while at the same time conveying the work from the perspective of the people who are actually doing it. So that's what I do. And I, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of sort of my past work in this vein. Um, I, I think a lot about how people are skilled and how they develop expertise at, at their work. I'm very, I get very excited to kind of figure out what is that work all about and how are the people doing it? Uh, my very first study, uh, was a study of a university biotech facility. And so I, I learned, I spent a lot of time with lab technicians. And one of the things I found totally interesting was how they would say things like, my cells look really happy today. Well, how do technicians know that their cells are happy and how do they sort of character? It's a very embodied understanding of like, what is, if biologists really care about the cells, right? And they look happy. What kind of media can I add to my cell colony to make them happier? And what did this person who came into the lab last week as a guest do to my cells, right? So they're very like touchy about this. Um, I think that sort of embodied technical understanding of how people use their tools to develop knowledge is super important to expertise at work. And so because of that, I also try when I do my research to do the work that I'm studying. So I try, I think it helps to understand the work better if you try to do it. And um, so for instance, I studied um, salespeople and I was telling some of the graduate students today how I didn't much enjoy that particular study. But what I did was um, I, I was studying Xerox sales and I spent a month at the Xerox sales training facility because I wanted to understand like, what are these, at Xerox has a very famous, they're actually very famous for their sales training, it goes back to like the 70s, but like, the, so they have this big program where they train their salespeople. And I was like, why are they selling the way they're selling? Like, why am I seeing this? And so I did the sales training. I was miserable at it. I, I, I did very well on the exam, but I didn't do so well on the actual selling part. But I felt like that by doing that, you really kind of learn, okay, this is what sales feels like, right? So I try to do that in all of my projects. Additionally, following kind of anthropologists of work like Jean Lave, Julian Orr, 
Lucy Suchman, I, I go into all the settings assuming that people develop expertise on the job, not just by doing the work, but by doing it within a community of people. Like that's how they learn it. So this picture is a picture, it's supposed to be a picture of a school, right? My, one of my recent projects is a study of how teachers learn how to be good teachers. Um, and one of the things, so what we're looking at is how hallways, basically um, the space in which teachers can see one another, hallways is basically the most, the, they spend so much time in their classroom that the place that we, where they're really enacting what it means to be a good teacher within their community is in the hallway. So um, in this paper, we argue that, that the collective designation of the hallway as a teaching space really matters to how teachers learn to be good teachers. And we show how they use it like tangibly as a resource, like they talk about teaching in the hall, they give each other like to share ideas for how to be a good teacher. They also use it symbolically to demonstrate I am being a good teacher and they evaluate one another in the hallways as that person is not being a good teacher. I can see there's kids standing on the desks in their classroom or whatever, right? Um, and we compare two schools in the same district. Super interesting. Same two high schools, same district. They actually are structured. The hallways themselves are structured kind of similarly. And in one hallway, the way teachers enact being a good teacher is by keeping discipline in order. And in the other school, the way they enact being a good teacher is by talking about pedagogy and curriculum. It's all about academics. And you can see, you can actually see the way that they talk about one another in the hallway, the things that they do in the hallway are all reflect these two different communities where expertise is something very different in these two high schools. Um, so in one school, they're like sharing lesson plans in the hallways, they're putting up like their student work in the hallways. In the other school, they are talking about how they broke up fights and they are like actually breaking up fights um, and disciplining students. And so what is real, I think really interesting about this is the way that they interact in the hallway um, basically conveys the values of what it means to be a good teacher. And I think throughout my work, I have kind of this notion that it's the interactions like on the ground at work that really matter to what the work ends up looking like. So then I have a bunch of projects where, which look at the same kind of notion of social interaction at the workplace, but look at it in the context of collaboration because social interaction is obviously important when you think about how groups work with one another, you know, kind of across. And so many of my projects have examined how people and organizations get work done together. And in particular, my early work, a lot of it looked at different ways that production work was organized and coordinated. So on the, to your right, um, on the right side of the screen um, is an image of a semiconductor equipment manufacturing plant. And this is one of my very early studies of a factory. And I was looking at how engineers, technicians, and assemblers used machines and drawings as boundary objects. So they would use these, these tools both to accomplish their joint work and also as representations of the authority that they had and the legitimacy that they, that they had to do their work. Um, the organizations really valued the engineering drawings and that's pretty typical in, some of the, in an engineering organization, right? The engineering drawings are supposed to tell you how to build the product. But in fact, the technicians, the assemblers in particular couldn't read the drawings, didn't understand them. And so whenever there were problems in the organization and they needed to solve those problems as they were prototyping these different machines, um, the problem solving was done around the machines. And the, the, en the engineers and the assemblers could all understand what the machine looked like. And so the, engineer the engineers could understand what the, tech the technicians and assemblers were saying were, was problematic because they couldn't use the drawings to do that. So, so it was kind of a contrast. Um, then the next project I did was a study of film production crews at which the coordination was sort of opposite of that. So also very kind of technical work. Um, but on film production crews, the informal kind of interactions were what coordinated everything. So they had drawings, they had, well, the equivalent of engineering drawings in a, on a film set is like the daily schedule. They had documents and structures that were supposed to kind of guide what they did on a regular basis, but they were treated very loosely, right? And instead the way that um, film crew basically were able to coordinate their work was through a very informal set of guidelines, role expectations about how it was they were supposed to do their job. They spent a lot of time kind of standing around on the set, watching each other work, 
joking about what it was that they were supposed to be doing and thanking one another for doing things in the right way. And because of these informal interactions, they then could understand what, it was, what everybody's individual jobs were because they were sitting there watching them do it all the time. And that helped them really to guide to guide them to understand like how they could coordinate their work. So um, two very <clears throat> different forms of, of informal coordination in these two organizations. Some of my work actually does comparisons across organizations. And one of the things that you get to learn from that is kind of, okay, these are two production organizations. How is it that things are different and the same across them that can help us theorize about what organizations do? Um, and so I also wrote a paper where I compared the two. And one of the things that I saw in that comparison was the importance of the occupational community and how it kind of played out in these two different locations. So on a, um, in a semiconductor equipment plant, occupational control was super latent. It was kind of in the backdrop. Like the organization really controlled everything through the drawings. Um, and the, so the organization kind of dominated that coordination process. And the informal occupational standards were only brought in for problem solving kind of behind the scenes. Whereas on film sets, the occupational control was really out there. Like it was really upfront. And basically most film um, production companies let the occupational groups run the show. So the occupational control is really much more dominant um, than it is in this other setting. So one of the arguments I made in that paper was, look, you can really see how work, how work plays out is affected by the ways that the occupational communities are embedded within organizations and how the organization acknowledges occupational control. Which brings me to the sort of broader picture um, of organizations and institutions and work. So basically, I'm also very interested in the organizational and institutional mechanisms that influence how work unfolds. And so I'm going to spend a little more time on this one because this is my most recent big ethnographic project, which was a study of a crime laboratory. And I studied the work of forensic scientists. And what I'm looking at here is what it means to be a scientific expert within the criminal justice system. And this project has a bunch of different strands. Um, the book came out earlier this year. Um, and what I'm going to share with you is kind of a work in progress. So I've been working on a, a paper that I'm submitting to a journal. It's still a little drafty, but um, it examines the culture of anticipation within crime labs. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about that. Okay, so I spent a year and a half in, um, in a large crime laboratory in a Western state that I am calling Metropolitan County Crime Lab or MCCL for short. I studied four different units in the lab and I did participant observation there. Um, I wasn't allowed to do the work like I have been in some of my other projects. So I did get a chance to kind of practice some of the techniques because people there were excited to have me like, oh, you wanna learn how to run DNA? Here, let's take a cheek swab of your cheek and we'll run it through the whole. So I'm now in the files in this Western state. My DNA is there. Um, and I learned how to do some other things. I went to the, you know, to the shooting range and stuff. Um, I sat with all the analysts and um, many on multiple occasions and also the supervisors. And then I did some formal interviews and I did some visits to other places. Um, and I'm happy by the way to talk about ethnography but in the q and I don't wanna to spend too much time on it. Um, and so what am I arguing? Basically, first as a context, forensic science is basically expert work that sits at this intersection between science and law. And so these folks are technicians, basically, They're, they do bench science, they work hard to do good science, right? They are members of the forensic science community, and they really care about doing good forensic science. But at the same time, their job is to communicate about this science and their findings to people in the criminal justice community. So they also spend time interacting with police, investigators, district attorneys before and after they do their analysis. And just as background, the way that organizational structure of crime labs in the United States works is that they're embedded within, the, within agencies, right? So they report to particular criminal justice agencies within a particular uh, jurisdiction or location, right? So maybe it's the FBI <clears throat> has a bunch of labs, the Department of Justice has a bunch of labs, police um, departments, sheriff's offices, district attorney's offices, and those agents, whichever agency the lab reports to also controls the laboratory's budget. 
Um, the other thing about forensic science is that it's extremely consequential work, right? So these are experts who rep provide reports and testimony um, that have real consequences for defendants, for victims. And so as a result, it tends to be a field that's under a lot of public scrutiny. So you may have heard a bit about forensic science over the last few years. Um, just as I started my field work doing, doing this project, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report about forensic science that basically said, very bluntly, forensic science is junk science, right? Like there's a lot of things about forensic science that needs the scientific basis, needs reinforcing, lack of training, a lack of specialized procedures, there's no accountability, there's all sorts of things. Um, and no resources. And very specifically, one of the things that was said was that like DNA profiling was the only part of forensic science that was grounded in real science and the rest of the sciences in forensic science didn't have the same kind of rigor. And so I have another paper that kind of explores what, what that meant for every, every of the other subfields of forensic science, essentially <clears throat> that some of them really responded to this challenge to be like more DNA, be more like DNA by changing what they did and others really resisted. But, but I think in a broader sense, even prior to this report, criminalists already felt like they were under scrutiny due to their position, their role within this criminal justice system. And so what I wanna talk about in this paper and what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about is how that position in this system affects the work within the laboratory. So, the first thing is that what you have in a crime lab is like they're at the intersection of these two worlds of science and law. So I, the, from the very first day I was there, I would hear criminalists talk about science in a very sort of classic Mertonian way. Like they would be like, I don't have a horse in this race, like very objective, very skeptical. It's about knowledge. Um, and that was sort of how they talk about it and also, it looks like a lab, right? It's a, they're sitting at benches, they're doing bench science. So from like a Latorian perspective, it's a science lab, right? At the same time, they're in this system of law and the system of justice is about, has other norms and practices. It's about fairness, it's very bureaucratic. It's about it being accountable to the public. And it also has a very adversarial structure, which is pretty unlike the sort of communal norms and science. And so they're similar, they're both about knowledge production. They're also quite different. Fact-making in law is really about creating knowledge related to justice in a very particular case. Whereas fact-making in science is about sort of truth that's detachable from the context where you produce it, right? So <clears throat> this means they also have conflicting images about what to do with evidence. So in science, we're about like, reproducibility, truth from nature, right? In law, we're gonna get it all out. We're gonna look for vulnerabilities in the other person's argument and the rules of engagement are very different there. So in law, it's about more like high theater and in science, it's about like natural truth, right? So some of these things um, conflict in the world of criminalists. And I think that to understand kind of how they feel about this, you have to, think about what happens in the courtroom. So the courtroom is a place, the most salient place where the world of science and criminal justice and the public kind of overlap. And it's a place where they feel the most threatened as criminalists. Um, it's where they directly encounter the representatives of the law and the public, and they feel like their scientific values, their values as an occupation are being threatened. And so I'm gonna just give you an example of a narcotics analyst who I call Taylor. Um, and I was interviewing him about his courtroom experiences and he described this time where he testified and the attorney asked him on the stand to say that a defendant's impairment was due to the drugs in his system. And he did not think, he didn't feel comfortable saying that because as he said, the problem with the science is that other things could be going on. So I can say probably or even likely, but I can't make that leap to state definitively that the person was impaired by drugs. So, and he told the attorney this in advance before he went on the stand, um, but she then asked him conclusively to state that on the stand and he wouldn't. And then he told me, oh yeah, she called me afterwards. And she chewed me out and she said I went sideways, which is a term they mean to use to testify on the behalf of the other attorney rather than for them. And I told her, I'm not on your side. I'm not on anyone's side. I'm on the side of what the evidence is. But she was really angry, he said. And then he went on to say, everyone in there has their own agenda. 
And I'm the only one that has an agenda for the evidence that just tries to clarify what the evidence means, what it doesn't mean, and what the limitations of it are. And I think this example is kind of a good one of what it means to try and present your kind of messy science on the stand in a place where people who are asking you questions don't share that same understanding of the science, right? So they want to present the evidence in a way that's kind of true to their beliefs about what science is, but they feel they're in a system that doesn't care about the science. And so you can see where this system can threaten their sense of scientific values and expertise. And so what the paper does goes into a lot of detail about well, what does that mean for the work, right? So the main argument in the paper is that forensic scientists face these threats to their occupational values from the rest of the criminal justice system. And I describe as expert workers, how they try to manage this, these threats. And what I do, so they know what's gonna happen in the courtroom. They feel like <clears throat> the practices of the legal system are very different um, and that they expect they're going to get attacked by these lawyers in this adversarial process um, who don't understand the scientific process. So they develop what I'm calling practices of anticipation within the lab in order to maintain their sense of occupational integrity and values and expertise. And they do this in two ways. One way is by kind of incorporating what they expect from the criminal justice system. So they're trying to translate forensic science to non-experts because they know that their work when it gets used in the courtroom has to be understood by a whole bunch of people who don't understand science, right? The attorneys, the, ju the juries, the justices have to understand what they found. So they incorporate things about the scientific justice, the criminal justice community into their work. So they spend a lot of time thinking about how the language that they use um, and, and the ways that they communicate can best express the science while being compelling. So they create very beautiful digital images of like bullet comparisons with very carefully lit, right? So that people can see them and they look good. Um, they use different metaphors for scientific processes. So the one I heard all the time was about how when you multiply DNA, there's a very elaborate um, scientific process for it that they basically compare to Xerox copying, right? So like they, they do, they prepare um, to be able to show their results in ways that are true to the science at the same time, it's understandable by lay people, right? So that's one set of things they do. And the other set is kind of about protecting the science. They spend a lot of time what they call educating the community and the public um, in a very broad way. They do lots of training sessions for the different people in the criminal justice community. Um, and they also do it narrowly with respect to particular cases where they're kind of negotiating and and resisting the requests of the criminal justice community. So they will basically tell the prosecutor why the lab is not going to analyze the hundreds of beer bottles that they picked up at a bar where there was a knife fight, right? And explain to them why that's not very useful. Or they'll explain why gunshot residue found on the hand of a suspect doesn't necessarily mean that the person actually fired the gun, right? So they spend a lot of time doing that. And like I said, I have all these different practices that I think are important, but I don't have the time to tell you about all of them. So I'm gonna focus on just one from each column. I'm gonna talk about how they develop what they call their voice, like you heard Taylor say, the voice of the evidence. And then I'm gonna talk about um, how they negotiate about requests. So a lot of times, like I said, they feel, they anticipate feeling that the science and even their self is gonna be under attack in the courtroom. And the science they know is it's messy, it's ambiguous, it is not always, it's not 100%, right? Um, however, they also know that attorneys really prefer easily explainable bright lines and distinctions about what's going on. So what they do is spend time rehearsing their role in the courtroom. Um, they spend, they go to what they call mock court sessions. They do those in the lab. They also do those when they go to their professional association meetings. And so I actually, um, went to one of these meetings um, and spent two days in a mock court workshop and watched as a bunch of new criminalists were being taught how to behave in the courtroom. And <clears throat> basically they, they presented a case and testified in front of two veterans who pretended to be attorneys. And then the veterans gave them feedback um, and they <clears throat> said things like, well, you said amylase without defining it. 
or complimented somebody for really describing a scientific concept well. Um, they also advised um, all the criminalists, like, do not use street language. You said coke. You have to, have to remember it's cocaine when you're in the courtroom. Um, and also, you need to understand the courtroom procedures, right? You interrupted me. I wasn't finished. You have to wait. Like, that's the process that you have to follow, right? So all of these were are important because they want criminalists to understand you can't present unvarnished scientific findings in a courtroom, right? You need to understand that you, you have to anticipate that the juries want you to, you know, have give them polite lay explanations for what you're doing. The attorneys want you to give something decisive, right? The judges want you to follow the courtroom procedures. So they, <clears throat> they understand you're going to have questions in the courtroom and they're going to make you feel bad. They're going to make you feel like you're not being true to the science in the way that you want to feel. Um, so you need to carefully think through ahead of time how, um, how you can make your statements without violating your occupational values. So that's one side of the sort of story in terms of their practices. And the other side is about how they try to kind of educate the community about science. And one of the things that happens a lot is there'll be a request that comes in and the criminalists don't feel like they should be doing the kind of analysis that they're being asked to do. Oh, I didn't move ahead, did I? Okay. Um, and so if they feel like they don't have the expertise or that the analysis is going to add something, I heard a lot of complaints about this, right? So, um, so I was standing with some DNA analysts um, in, the, in the hallway outside of a courtroom, and a bunch of them were kind of talking about recent requests for analysis that they got. And one said, the police submitted some bottles from a burglary, which they picked up off the road, not even in the house. They don't even know if the suspect was there. And another one chimed in and said, I had a case recently with four different cigarette butts. They put them all in the same evidence envelope, right? So the mm -hmm. this is a problem, right? Not only because they're not sure whether the analysis even makes sense for them to do, but also because you put four cigarette butts from four different people in the same envelope, and all of a sudden you have really made the DNA analysis very, very complicated because it rubs off, right? So now you've got like a very messy analysis to do. And so they consider that to be contaminated, right? So they have concerns about the scientific accuracy of some of these analyses. They don't just complain, but they also tend to resist and push back. So in another example, an I was at a unit meeting of the chemistry unit and um, one of the analysts there was talking about a trace evidence case that he had received. Um, and he said, I got this dom domestic violence case. The suspect basically pulled her out of the car and kicked her in the back. He broke her tailbone. They want me to test for any fibers from her clothing on his steel-toed boots. But that is only a test for association, and it won't tell them anything more, and because they already have both of them reporting that this thing happened in this parking lot, um, and they both say that. And so it can't, it, I can't prove the action of, of the kick just from this association. So I need to go talk to the DA and tell them that. So they were all talking about like, this is what you need to say to the DA, right? They're making, um, <clears throat> helping him to kind of, this is what, this is how you should talk to the DA. And so what you see is that they're trying to explain the science, even as they're resisting, they're trying to say, this is why this isn't a good idea. Please next time, don't put the cigarettes all in the same envelope, right? This is why you shouldn't be doing that. Um, and spend a lot of time trying to educate them, the attorneys and the investigators, so that their expertise is not undermined and their scientific values are not violated on the stand. So what do we learn about expert work from this? I think that seeing the culture of anticipation in a crime lab expands our understanding of the work of experts. A lot of what criminalists are doing is about protecting their values. They're protective of the scientific process. They value it, they think it's important, and they want everybody else there to do that also. They're protective of their scientific expertise, and they want to make sure that um, their use, the use of the evidence is staying true to, this, to the scientific knowledge. And they're also protect, protective of their scientific self. Right? They, they know that the attorneys are going to attack them, and they don't want to be embarrassed or worse. Um, but at the same time that they're doing all this protection, they're also working hard to integrate all of the institutional demands of the criminal justice system into their work. It's important to them that their work have value, that it's good, right? So I think that what I saw here to me really is um, a contribution to the literature on expert ex occupations. 
because a lot of the literature on occupations is really focused on quest competition between occupations for things like legitimacy and tasks. So expert groups, we know they tend to use a lot of rhetoric to try and claim that their way of doing a particular kind of work is better than some other group's way. They also are very interested in protecting their autonomy over the tasks that they value, right? That, and so that's the, what the literature kind of looks like. Um, but what I saw here was actually not competition for legitimacy or, or negotiating around task boundaries, right? This is a group that nobody's trying to do their work. Like nobody's trying to steal, you know, what, it, what does it mean to, you know, we'd like to do that work instead of you, right? And nobody thinks that their work isn't legitimate, right? So they're not arguing over these things, but instead they really care a lot about protecting their values. They want, they want to kind of protect those within the domain of the space in order to be able to do good work, right? And so that's kind of what I think is interesting here. And, and that's what makes the anticipatory practices like permeate their regular work is they're constantly thinking about, we want them to value what we value. Um, and I also think that we see this kind of dynamic in a lot of other domains of expertise, right? So like, for instance, I did this study a while ago, but during the pandemic, like this really, you could see the scientists, right? Like, so we've had like all of these debates about, pandemic science, right? Um, and, pan and like the work of scientists across the globe in the case of the pandemic is just like this, right? The science of viruses, it's extremely messy. Um, doctors, PhDs, epidemiologists are all interpreting their results, right? And making predictions and none of their findings are 100% accurate. The science is always changing and there's additional discoveries. And so a year and a half ago, the question was, do we need to wear masks? And look at us now, right? <laughs> um, right. So, and the, the fact that they couldn't answer this definitively a year and a half ago has something to do with their position within the system of science, government science, basically, right? And they're constrained by their position in that system. And they're in the same kind of position as forensic scientists, experts who need to make a compelling case to the public in order to sort of have the science understood, right? Um, and I think what the study teaches us kind of <clears throat> theoretically is that location in the field matters for expert work. So these institutional and organizational structures affect work outcomes. And this is also very important to shift gears a little um, when we think about technologies and how they impact work. And so that's like the second paper I wanna tell you about. Um, and I think I don't have as much time as I'd hoped, but um, I've been working on the question of like while I was writing the book, I was thinking and thinking about this sort of question of expertise of scientific workers and how that was changing. And that was at the same time when the world of digital technologies was completely expanding, right? And it became really clear that, that we need to think about this more. Um, and we need to think about how digital technologies are pervading like all forms of work. So I have a lot of students doing these projects that are related to this question, but with a couple of colleagues, I've also written like a conceptual paper about AI that argues about how collaboration with AI might best be studied. And I say that um, in this context of recent arguments about AI have kind of narrowed. We're now not saying in the press, oh, AI is gonna take everybody's jobs. We're saying crazy things like <laughs> that AI and humans are gonna be super teams. I have no idea what that means. Super minds. Oh, this one says super minds. Yeah, right, so like we think that AI is gonna be collaborating with people in a very explicit way, people are saying this. And this is something <clears throat> that we don't know that much about. Excuse me, I need water. Um, I hate to take off my mask, but there you go. Um, we know a lot, like there's a ton of studies about, we know about the biases of AI and the benefits and dangers of AI have been starting to be um, pretty well explored. But we know much less about what's happening in organizations with respect to how AI is affecting work. And so on the other hand, we know a ton um, in the literature on technology and work, we have like 30 years of knowledge about what do we know about how technologies are implemented and what does that mean for work? So the three of us, myself and um, my colleagues, Ann, Laura, Fayard and Callan Anthony said, can we, you know, we need to think about this more. Let's write a conceptual paper and draw on what we know about technology in the workplace um, and think about how AI might be the same and different from that, right? So in particular, in, among scholars who study collaboration, um, <clears throat> we know a bunch of stuff, 
we want to bring it to bear on the question of AI, think about how what we know applies, how AI might be the same or different from what our current conceptualizations are, and what we could do as scholars to learn more about this in a more rigorous way. So we do this review, we, lo we look at the organizational literature and how um, technologies are used at work. One stream of this literature kind of looks at technology as a tool, um, which basically is this notion of how we interact with technologies when we first use it, when we use them in organizations has an effect on how we do our work, right? Our skills develop in relation to technologies and how we use them. In particular, there's an interesting argument around who questions their tools and who doesn't. And, and it kind of argues that experts often question their tools. They want to look inside. They, they don't take their tools for granted, right? So when experts use technologies, they're testing them all the time to see if they really are doing what they want them to do. Um, and one of the things that we sort of thought about is, well, okay, how do you test AI? Like is AI, so there's this whole notion of who black boxes and experts don't black box. But the problem with AI is that some of the outputs of AI kind of are a black box. Like we can't figure out how they got to their answer. And that this could potentially be a way in which AI might be different from other technologies, right? It might actually be more black box-ish. Um, and I think that raises questions for how people use AI, how people using AI, how the people who are using AI have their expertise change. Okay. Then there's a second line of research and my own research is sort of a part of this category research, which looks at technology as kind of a medium for collaboration, right? So <clears throat> schol uh, scholars talk about how different groups and organizations use technologies to co communicate with one another, to collaborate, right? That they use technologies in particular as boundary objects. That's one of the line of research that I've done, but other people as well, that these boundary objects are very flexible, right? So if, if you have an object that's flexible, people can use it in different ways, put it kind of within their own understanding and it'll help them to communicate. So the same way that the story I told you about the engineers and the assemblers using the machine, flexible enough for different people to kind of understand, helps them solve problems. Then um, we started thinking about, well, does AI have that kind of interpretive flexibility? Well, we're not really sure, right? And what you see among the sort of early scholars who started to study AI as this kind of medium in organizations is that a lot of times what people are doing is trying to repair stuff around the AI instead of communicate using it or negotiate with it. So Melissa, you have some work in this domain. Also, there's a recent, <clears throat> study by Elish and Watkins on the on sepsis watch, which is all about how nurses are basically translating what the AI puts out so that the doctors can use what it says, right? So there's this question I think that comes up is how AI might actually be or not be used as a boundary object, I think is a reasonable question to ask. Where we came down actually, after doing all this lit review, is that we wanted to argue for taking a slightly different approach in the organization's literature to what's been done before. And if you really take seriously this notion of super teams, super minds, the idea that technology is going to be a counterpart, that you might have to approach the, you know, what it, how to represent it, what conceptually matters a little bit differently. And so here we drew on the literature in STS and distributed cognition to start to think about, well, what does it mean to, for technology to be a counterpart, right? Um, so like, Ed Hutchins' work in distributed cognition kind of argues that, you know, people negotiating on a, uh, not negotiating, people navigating on a ship, right? Like if you're doing ship navigation, it's not just the, it's not just the officers on the ship who are doing it. It's the whole system navigation that matters. It's the objects that they're using. I don't even know the names of these things, but the Polaris and the other, like the, the charts that they've got, right? And the, and the landmarks in the distance. All of those things work together as a system and you need to include the objects and technologies in order to understand how cognition works. And the other thing, I think, if you think about the STS literature and what it means to collaborate with technology, we're drawing a little bit on actor network theory, right? To say artifacts are, can be an important actor within this system of collaboration. Um, and what's nice about actor network theory is that it really calls attention to the fact that artifacts are not neutral. And we know that for sure, right? That artifacts have bunches of assumptions built into them that are artifacts have politics, right? Like so that these things are not neutral, 
And it puts technology kind of in the forefront of thinking about, if you think about it as a system of relationships where, where actors are both human and technology, that sort of allows you to take a broader view on what does it mean to implement AI. And so we've been trying to do that. Um, we also, so we think, you know, a systems approach is really important. Um, need to figure out who are the actors, how are they related to each other, what are the relationships there and the dynamics and how do they play out. I think a systems approach in a room full of people who have ties to computer science and engineering is probably not that new, uh, but to organization theorists, I think it kind of is. And so we're excited to kind of bring this approach in to organization theory to think about studying AI. And we actually kind of lay out a research agenda for what it would mean to actually do these kinds of projects so that we need to expand our ethnographic practices and do more relational ethnography where we're thinking about configurations of relations among the different actors and institutions that are involved in a particular um, implementation. Uh, so if you think about Matt Desmond's study of eviction, he looks at a field of multiple actors. So you have tenants, landlords, lawyers, and they're all acting out in a particular, in different kinds of settings. He's there in their homes, he's in the courtroom, he's in the homeless shelter, right? Like he's all over the place in this field in order to figure out all the relations. Um, similarly, Adele Clark has this notion of situational analysis that I think is really helpful here, right? That we think about the non-human actors, like the technologies, and she encourages also looking at the less powerful actors and what does that mean for how we're implementing these technologies and argues that we should draw this giant map, which is very complicated, <clears throat> but includes like all the complexities. Who are the people involved? What are the technologies involved? What are the discursive activities that are going on in that space? What's the historical context? What are the political dynamics, right? Like all of these different elements and draw out those relationships. Complicated requires a team is what we're arguing, a team of ethnographers. And after today, I was also thinking we could use like a computer scientist on that team too. Um, and that we wanna think about like studying multiple parts of that system and getting multiple perspectives on, the, on what they're doing with the AI, including the users, the decision makers, the developers pretty much all these different pieces, studying it longitudinally so you know what historically went before, archival data, what's going on currently, thinking about how it evolves. Alternatively, you could also study different settings, right? So how, if you think about Kensho, that my initial example, right? All the different banks that are, that um, Kensho is implementing their AI into, like, well, how are they using them differently? Or the scary thing, Kensho is also selling its product to the government, so like, um, the agencies that are using their tool, like how might that be different from the banks? I think that would be fascinating. I couldn't get access to Kensho, by the way, I tried. Um, so <clears throat> that's kind of what my next step is in terms of my research. So my current research agenda, I'm thinking about this as like my, possibly my next big ethnographic project. And in particular, we, I haven't figured out where yet, but one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is, AI and hiring promotions, like it's in a lot, AI is in a lot of places now in terms of how like kind of we're treating people in organizations. And I have a bunch, my, my undergraduates report to me that many of their first interviews are happening on video, right? And those videos, it's like, it's a standard set of questions that are being screened by machine learning tools. They're not being screened by people. Right? And what does that mean, right? And so I think that that could be possibly an interesting space where we could ask these kinds of questions. And I also, just to end up, in case you're wondering about my other projects, I have some other things going on. Um, I was telling some people, oh, and I was telling some people that I, um, I met with somebody at the New York Public Library recently. I think that would be a fascinating space to study kind of the institutional challenges related to the digital age. So that might go somewhere, I have no idea. But I also continue to do research related to collaboration. So I have a couple of projects that look at the implementation of open social innovation, one with a colleague where, you know, so open social innovation is like cross sector collaboration, basically, to solve big social problems. Um, and so I have a couple of projects in that space, one of which is with a, a current doctoral student where she's been doing a virtual ethnography of a nonprofit incubator. And basically they're supporting a bunch of startups in Indonesia that are trying to solve ocean plastic problems. And it's super interesting, right? Because you have so many different interests and, and logics and practices across that space in terms of the different actors that are involved that it, it raises like a lot of questions about collaboration. 
And then the last thing I'm sort of just starting out is um, a project with the CTSI, the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute at NYU, where we're trying to look into transdisciplinary medical research. They fund a lot of pilot projects that are also, it's collaborations of people from different spheres of the university um, and how they get those pilot projects, how the, which ones evolve to be successful collaborations and which ones don't and why. And that's kind of what I'm up to. <laughs> Thank you. You definitely left a little bit of time for questions. Not a ton. Not a ton. Sorry. That's okay. These short, these short presentations are hard, but we can open it up for any questions that we might have. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you would go to different places and observe the people working. Um, how do you limit, or I guess, do you notice, or I guess I don't know if you would notice this, but. Um, do you think that their behaviors change? Well, I think that's a fair question. I think what happens is in the beginning, when you go into a new organization, um, people aren't as comfortable with you. And so they probably aren't behaving completely the way they would normally if you weren't there. But eventually you sort of become like this person who they see every day, like one of their regular coworkers. And so you see them relax. And, you know, like it, in the crime lab, they were really into rock band you know the game it's, it's old now but we used to play rock band and you know they asked me to play i'm like 20 years older than these people but i play, i'm playing rock band with them right um and so you start to sort of work your way into the culture or the fabric of the organization and people sort of just sort of start to treat you sort of like a co-worker yes in the, in the crime lab where you were working, did you notice any reorientation around the AI that they were using or were they using AI? So I, I don't think they were using, I mean, they certainly have a set, a set of tools that they use. Um, the, they have the system in this particular lab, it's called LIMS, which is like the data management. It's a giant database basically that was shared between the criminal justice system and the lab. Um, and while I, so I could have done, I could have turned this into a study of technology implementation because while I was there, they revamped limbs and they changed the whole thing. So I did get to see how they interacted a lot with the technology, but there's a ton of research on kind of technology implementation. And I didn't see anything that I thought was from a theoretical perspective, all that interesting. People get very frustrated when the technology doesn't do what they want it to do. And when it, especially when it takes longer than it used to, right? Like, so this process used to take me five minutes. Now I literally had somebody say, now it takes 13. <laughs> yes. Talk about are you referring to status? Are you referring to location? When thinking of public participation <clears throat> in which there are conflicts about who is in charge of what mm -hmm. and who has higher status, et cetera, right? So, for example, I'm, I'm thinking when someone runs a PET scan, you have the radiologist, the local pathologist, mm -hmm. the primary care doctor, and then there's a whole protocol that people need to follow for you to be used this information, right? Et cetera. <clears throat> and so, yeah, if you could talk about that. So I, I don't think of so in this particular situation, I wasn't thinking it so much as, as so much of status, like in the sort of sociological sense, position wise, because <clears throat> they are low status, right? Like there's just no question that they are not there. So what I'm I'm look, when I talk about in this paper, and I didn't have time to really unpack this term, so I didn't use it, is that they're peripheral experts, right? Like their goals and what they do for the system is not like the core of what the system does, right? And so their peripherality to it means they have to work that much harder to get their voice heard, but I'm not sure it's necessarily about like a hierarchy of status, if you know what I mean. Yes. Do you think yes. that's very ground based on the past few years in that it's actually the way they interact? That criminalist peripherality? notice them being treated as you know higher status I, I think that um 
they're necessary, right? Like we want their expertise, um, but they're also like only a part of what, like if you think about their position vis-a-vis -vis the attorneys, right? The attorneys have to make arguments. They often don't have a lot of time to do it in. They don't have a lot of time to prepare. Like we want the, we want the finding, like it's great if the lab can put their stamp on it and say, we absolutely know that this is the guy. That would be great for them. Most of the time they can't do that, right? And so this is a small part of kind of the process, but I don't, I don't think they, they, you know, since like the proliferation of TV shows about, you know, criminalists, like there's a sense that like, we would love to have evidence about it for every single time we go in there, but it's just, it, it, the real world doesn't work, <laughs> doesn't work like that, right? So they're, they're not, at, they're not any, I think, any more important than they were before. Uh, so I have, a, I have a couple questions from online. We had about 25 people uh, join. So this is from one of our PhD students, Thomas Gray. Uh, he said, thanks. The one question I thought of is how to balance individual and collective performance metrics in organizations. Do you think AI is going to push us to focus more on teams or more on individuals in terms of work? Oh, that's a really interesting question. So I think, so what I actually think is that organizations are mostly trying to bring it in to replace particular types of work um, or as support for decisions that people are making. So in that sense, it's pretty individual, but I think most of the time organizations are not as aware of how collective work actually is. <laughs> so I think for every system or every technology you bring in, it's, there's a different answer to that question, depending on what's intended and what actually gets rolled out by people and how it gets used. And, and one other uh, question from one of our faculty, Robert Crooks, uh, who, who asks, uh, who thanks you and asks, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the approaches to study, to the study of AI versus organizational theory? Thinking in particular about questions of invisible or undervalued labor with respect to AI, e.g. quick workers yeah, and yeah. data sets, is this something that organizational theory might help us understand? So um, we drew a li little bit in our paper on one of your graduates, Lily Arani's work, um, think and thinking about like this notion of um, how, you know, what does it mean? What, how does AI actually replace work? And so I think, I think that um, what org theory brings to this, I'm not sure I can answer this question in just a very straightforward way, but I do think that there's this whole question about what does it mean for labor, right? And how is, how does AI displace labor? How, how, what are the relationships between labor and AI? And I think that one of the things that org theory can bring is, um, a way to unpack what's going on within organizations to be able to say, well, in the in these instances, who, what are the people doing versus what is the technology doing? And I'll, I'll just bring up um, Ben Shestakovsky's work because he has this very interesting project and in a book coming out. He's a sociologist at Penn, and he looked at um, an organization that made all these claims about what their AI was going to do. It was a platform organization, and it did matching of people and tasks. Um, and he, the company basically was trying to match up all these people and all these jobs, but the AI couldn't do the work. So they basically ended up hiring a whole bunch of workers, temporary workers in the Philippines to do the matching and pretend that the AI was matching, right? And then it turned out that these temporary workers in the Philippines were awesome. Like they could do, they could do a whole bunch of things that, so what would happen is the company would then think, oh, what if our AI did this? Well, we can't get our engineers to make it do this in the next few months, but we can say that we can, and then we can get the workers in the Philippines to do it. So these temporary workers ended up working for them for quite some time, doing all the tasks that the AI was purporting to do until the AI caught up. And I think that that's the kind of thing that an org theorist would find out, especially an ethnographer, um, which tells us something about like really what's the relationship between labor and AI. Did the AI catch up? They still, so no, I mean, <laughs> yes and no, right? Because basically like it caught up, but then they would find something new that they wanted it to do and it couldn't do. Yeah, super interesting. Everybody should read his book. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Beth. And the service of, of, we're already a few minutes over, but we do have per usual, our lovely setup outside on the, the patio here. So we encourage, sorry for those of you on Zoom. So we encourage everybody here to go outside, have a drink, you know, have some snacks and, and chat.
Perfect. Well, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.